Five. What's up, Keegan? What is going on, Kyle? It is good to see you again. Likewise, I, I love the hat. I got to say, you you go the extra mile with respect to you know the personal brand. Oh, I wear this out uh, on date nights, out with friends. Uh, it's funny. My buddies actually say when we go like to like a place out where it's going to be popular, like maybe a, a live music event or something, like, can you not wear the hat? Because everyone comes up to you saying you're the software cowboy on LinkedIn. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. The notoriety is great. So wh while we're uh, we're going to get going here in a minute or two, just let more people trickle in. Talk to us about the background. You got don't quit. You got hustle. You got some curse words I'm not going to say out loud. To what what's going on behind you? This is my uh, my backdrop for motivation. I actually every day when I walk in, I'm like facing the wall. I walk in, I look at this, and like when I'm talking to reps, trying to get them pumped up because you know I started my career as well in, in SDR land, yeah. and so in climbing the ranks of SDR leadership before going into sales leadership. And it's half the mindset, half the the game of being successful at SDR is that mindset, right? And my dad always says positive mental attitude. It's like what he told me as an athlete. And so I kind of tell it to my reps. And I have this here as different things to reference, especially if they're kind of down in the rough. For example, SDR started this week and they're like, oh, I think we're behind meetings. I'm like, what are you talking about? We're in the middle of the month. Everyone's pacing, but this has to be the week. I'm like, go get your done. And they're like, okay, what happened? Everyone booked one to three meetings yesterday. And now they're like, we're ahead of pace. And I'm like, half the battle's up in here. It's so funny you say that, Key. I totally agree. Like sales in general, and especially SDR, especially if you're working from home mm -hmm. as an SDR, it is a mental battle. Um, so I'm glad that you take that mindset stuff seriously. The the challenge that I used to issue to reps and still do is, especially SDRs, Mr. or Mrs. SDR, if I gave you a million dollars, if you booked a meeting today, just one meeting with a key account, you know, executive at a key account, what would you do? You can't bribe them. Like what would be your tactics? How would you do this? And then they go and they talk about all the research they would do and the, the personalized emails and the omni-channel approach. I'm like, well, why aren't you doing that? Like, go do that. You just explain the playbook and people inevitably are like, oh yeah, okay. And then they go and book the meeting. Exactly, right? It's like, again, it's showing them how to do it, reiterating the process and then enforcing that positive mindset. And uh, I that's why I really like your stuff because it's like, I have actually seen it happen and i've coached that way and i've seen the reality of like when you enforce that show them encourage and then reinforcement of encouragement it exactly. just scales a whole org that's where you know i've had teams of 30 sdrs under me and a lot of them were top performers because that as that coach i always say i'm not a manager i'm a coach it's that mindset reset every day every day you walk in 100 100 percent. all right we are three minutes past the hour and we're going to get going here on the topic du jour. We're talking all about speed to lead. We're going to be talking about leveraging AI, leveraging data more broadly. And then we're going to talk about omni-channel sales. So before we get into those actual topics, Keegan, who are you? Where are, where do you live? Tell us about yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm Keegan Otter. I'm based in Scottsdale, Arizona right now. Uh, I just moved back here a year ago from Texas. Um, originally from actually Seattle, Washington, the greater Seattle area, which is a huge tech hub. And that's how I got introduced to tech. Uh, I started my career similar to yours, joining an early stage company that exploded. Uh, my journey started at outreach.io, uh, where it was just the Seattle office. And during my time there, they expanded Tampa, London, um, and kind of grow uh, their international presence. And I had the chance to go from being an entry-level SDR to an enterprise, breaking records, doing things outside the box, right? Figuring out this whole sequencing strategy playbook and how it ties to sales. Uh, and then I went into sales land as a mid-market account executive uh, at another unicorn that actually IPO, DoorDash. And then from there, I jumped into early stage because I really like to get my hands like dirty, get in the grit and start building. Beautiful. All right. That's such a good journey. Keegan. I'm sure we'll talk more about like your journey, Keegan, and the lessons yeah. learned along the way and all of that. Very similar to you. I got started in, in SaaS sales as an SDR back in uh, 2013 at a company called Looker. I was the sixth employee and then ended up growing the company or, or being at the company as it grew to about 800 employees. The SDR team, we grew globally. And I ended up managing a, a team of about 70 or so people in California, New York, and in Ireland. And oh, man, I miss going to Ireland every quarter. That was awesome. That, that would be fun. I, I <laughs> am was St. Fun. Patty's Day for all of you like uh, that haven't kept up with the calendars this Sunday. Don't forget. That's right. In That's Irish, right. Coming in hot. St. Patty's Day. <laughs> So uh, the we grew Looker from you know nothing to about 110 million in revenue, and then it was acquired by Google in 
2019 for two and a half billion. And probably the proudest thing about it is of the 110 million or so in revenue that we had, about 40% of it was outbound sourced. And so I became a just fervent and always believer in the power of outbound, took that over to my next company called Clary and 10x revenue in about five years or so. And then I recently jumped over to Copy AI here because I am just obsessed with what AI can do for sales teams and for individual sellers. And I'm really excited to talk about that today. So we're going to be talking about why speed matters, speed to lead. We're going to be talking about some common points of failure. Why do if everybody knows that speed to lead matters? So why are we so bad at it? Then we'll talk about how to leverage data, how to leverage AI. And if there is time for Q&A, we'll run some Q&A at the end. How's that sound, Keegan? Sounds great to me. Cool. So let's kick it off with uh, the first topic. Let's talk about speed. Why, why does speed matter when you're processing inbound leads? I, I hit this every day with my AEs, especially, um, and especially the SDRs of like, you need to identify speed to lead as the number one priority, especially when it's an inbound lead. So I could do the story of like, let's say your house floods, my house flooded, I own a rental property, it flooded. I didn't care about the best price. I didn't care about the best rating right away. All I cared about was being heard, being walked through how to solve that problem, and then getting someone there to solve the solution. My urgency was at an all-time red alert high. I had tenants in there, water was coming up through the ground, filling through the floors. I needed help ASAP. I submitted about 10 inquiries in the local Dallas area. Two got back to me one uh, within the same day. One was within five minutes. The other one was within two hours. Who do you think I went with? The one that got back to me within five minutes, we hopped on a call. And by the time we were done with the call, then that other person got back to me. I still was competitive and heard them out for their bid, but I was already sold because I had that relationship and understanding yeah. already built with that first prospect or that first company that reached out to me as a prospect. And guess what? They weren't the cheapest. They weren't the most expensive, but they sure earned my business right away because I had a need. And they were very speedy to make sure that my need was heard and they were going to deal with it. The That's such a good metaphor because the SDR is the first touch point for so many buyers. Now, buyers do their own research and they read a lot and they go to the analyst reports and they look at G2 and all of that. But the first human that they talk to in many cases is an SDR. Sure. And the way that that conversation unfolds sets the tone for what that experience is going to be like, not just as a buyer, but as a customer of your company. And so what you just talked about, Keegan, implicit in that was, if they're going to be hyper responsive to me now, they're going to be hyper responsive to me whenever I need them. And that is what buyers want and need. They wouldn't come to you if they're able to solve the problem themselves. They're coming to your company because they have a problem to solve. You need to show them that you have urgency. Quickly. Well, it's like, how many meetings were you in before this uh, webinar, right? You're probably in it. I was in back-to-backs up until now. It's so my entire life. When I'm taking time to go do research, right, and I have an inquiry, I don't want to wait two more days. I, I probably, like, I had that meeting Monday to, like, say, hey, this is an issue we need to solve. I'm looking for solutions as an executive to that problem. I don't need to, like, wait until Friday to hear back from somebody. I want it right away. And there's yeah. a statistic out there that if you are one of the first ones to reach out and get a hold of that prospect when they're inquiring about, you know, needs with that your business solves for, you're like 360 more like percent more likely to win that business if you're the first and fastest touch point to connect them to a human. And you just nailed it right there too. A lot of executives are changing their buying style. They have a reference, they have a community, they ask about a product, then they go to the reviews and then they're probably reaching out to a connection. They have some sort there, but at some point they are going to be connected to a rep, but there's so many people that forget that that's the most important part to act on as quickly as possible. 100%. And you just hit on some data points. You'll hear versions of this data from, or of these metrics from basically anybody you talk to. I've heard something and I experienced that if you are speedy, you know, if somebody comes in, requests a demo, and you respond to them within five minutes of that initial demo request, you are 100 times, not 100%, 100 times more likely to get next steps booked with them. And why is that? Because if they're reaching out to you, they're also reaching out to other solutions that they think are similar to you. And just like you did when the house flooded, you're reaching out to similar people to say, hey, these are five, I, I have a problem, I need to solve it right now. I'm gonna cast a wide net and see who, I, who can help me solve this problem. So you have to be, you have to play that competitive game. 
And if somebody takes a meeting with one of your competitors or quasi competitors before, you know, and you don't respond to them for a week, they could be three quarters of the way through their evaluation process and the ship has sailed. Yeah. You know, what's interesting too, is like, I was reaching out to obviously a different industry. They weren't really tech companies for my problem, but the same scenario where they had, they had a setup, they had a CRM, they had a chat bot and they had a form fill. Just like all these SaaS companies, all these innovative companies have that we, we mostly work with today, right? We have the tools in place, but again, where people make mistakes is building it out to be able to fully um, go through that customer journey and function of speed to lead. Like I think sometimes people are afraid of AI and using like automation in some ways that they're like, oh, it's going to like burn them out. Like we want it to have a manual rep. There are some cases where that could be true, right? There is where the personalization of manual touch matters. But when it comes to inbound, like you cannot sacrifice that speed to lead component. 100%. And the same is true on the outbound side. And I have a little story. I'm not saying that I recommend this tactic, but this is a real thing that happened. So just bear with me. It was, I was young. I was foolish. I was so obsessed with speed to lead, not just on the inbound side, but on the outbound side as well. You work so hard to get somebody to respond to you. And I'd been working, this is back 2013, 2014 in my SDR days. And I'd been working this lead for God knows how long, like six months or something like that. And, you know, had him on the hook and he was kind of noncommittal and it was nurturing and trying to find different angles and all the rest. And I was driving home. I worked in Santa Cruz and I, uh, California, I was driving home and I saw, you know, my GPS was up and I got the little notification that he responded to my email and said, okay, I'm ready to I'm ready to take the next steps and book a meeting. I pulled over onto the shoulder of the highway and turned on the hotspot and booked the meeting right there on the highway. Not the safest thing to do, but this is the, the level of the uh, obsession <laughs> that became. I, I've actually story. done that. Moving back from Texas to Arizona, the CEO of Speckit, a Melanie who I've done webinars with, came respond, responded to my email, came in bouncing. All right, we're ready to take a demo of Warmly. And I was like, let me just pull over real quick. I actually had to drive a little bit further because I was I was in New Mexico. So I was going between Texas and Arizona. So yeah. the service was spotty. I drove a little further until I had service, pulled over, made sure I was safe, and then set it up for uh, replying to that email and getting it booked. But again, like people should have that mindset of like, that's how important speed to lead is. Every like inbound inquiry where they want to have some form of next steps or action behind it is a diamond in the rough right? Cause yes. outbound outbound is, is great and it works and it, but it's, but it's a grind and it's hard. So when you do get those inbound, we always joked when I was an SDR, I'm like, someone's watching out. If I get an inbound lead, I'm not going to let that drop. I'm not going to fumble the back. Uh, seriously. I I'm mostly um, not surprised that you and I are on the same page about that. Keegan, I'm just disappointed that you are driving a car and not riding a horse. Like why aren't you commuting on horseback? Well, you know, when I, uh, when my company grows enough, if we get like bought out for a good price ticket, you bet I will have six, seven acres and I'll have one horse for me and one horse for the lady. <laughs> good. So now, okay. People are bought in, you know, you are whatever percentage, whether it's 360% or a thousand percent or whatever percent, you're way more likely to book a lead or to book a meeting when you follow up with the lead inbound app on whatever, as soon as possible. However, the data again shows that something like 85 or 90% of companies don't reach out to their inbound leads on the same day, let alone the same hour or let alone five minutes. So why, what, what is getting in people's way, Keegan? Why don't, if they know it's a problem, why are they unable to implement the processes that allow for this quickness that allow for the speed? I think sometimes, uh, there's a couple scenarios that can come up. I've definitely come across, um, how you kind of delegate and manage your projects. I do see a lot of people like when they have a strong outbound engine, I think they forget about inbound that's there to save them and give an extra cushion. And so I, what I think is you really have to look at the customer journey and put yourself like, a, that's why I told that story, put yourself in their shoes of like, okay, if I'm getting outbounded and I'm seeing and getting influenced by that SDRs and emails and so forth, then I come inbound because they grab my attention and I spend five minutes of 10 minutes of my time looking at your you know, website, looking at G2 and so forth, asking around and then putting an inquiry. Like I just spent my valuable time after probably doing 10 plus meetings because your outbound was influencing me and worked right now I'm inbound. But if you, if you're falling in that 90% that doesn't have that process set up, you're going to miss a lot of that influence from outbound that pushes inbound. I always tell people a good outbound books, you a ton of meetings, a great outbound books, you a lot of outbound and pushes inbound. Like you yeah. will see that increase, right? And another thing too, is I think people 
don't realize like all the time when they're buying this technology that if you build a couple workflows, you can really build a lot more inbound triggers that complement also your outbound motion. And so I think there's a gap where some people jump into, you know, building out these processes, they only focus on one thing. And if they go and look at inbound, they think of the minimal of like, okay, if they do an inbound demo request, then we'll have something queue up. But that's where a lot of people say, but we'll make it manual. Like we'll have a call task. Well, what if I come in on Sunday? Cause I, I don't know about you, but I, I work a little bit on Sundays. So what if I come in on Sunday that, that, that rep's not going to call me on Sunday. He's going to call me Monday, but it's going to get buried or he or she, it's going to get buried right with their other tasks that queued up over the weekend from an engagement. So why not have that be an automated piece? And you can use copy AI to make it more relevant. I've seen it firsthand and we're testing it here at Warmly. Yeah, uh, you're exactly right. Like so much is put on, well, we want the reps to have the right mindset and we want there to be urgency. And we want the, like, I recommend a, if you, when you get an inbound lead, it's a drop what you're doing sort of scenario to go and process that lead. It's special. And I don't mean like somebody downloaded a white paper or somebody attended this webinar. That's low to medium intent. Mm -hmm. But when you get somebody who's raising their hand as high as they possibly can and saying, give me a demo, or I want to start a free trial or whatever your main call to action is, you got to stop what you're doing. You've got to switch tasks and you've got to go and have the mental bandwidth to go and do that now. So that's one half of the equation is the, is the uh, manual process that mm -hmm. the SDR, the AE, or whoever is responsible for, for manning that inbound lead channel is manually addressing that lead. The second point that you made to make sure that nothing slips through the cracks, whether it's because it came in at 9 p.m. or because it came in on Sunday or because you were in an all hands and you couldn't have the super high speed to lead, maybe the right answer, and I think it is, is to build that automation system. So what are those triggers that you have built, Keegan? Like, Take us under the hood for how you've designed this for yourself. Yeah, actually, I, I want to touch on all that. For the process, what we actually have is the mentality of the coaching and reinforcement of the, for the reps. And we have this in our documentation for enablement too. But I actually rank our type of leads for our reps because our, our, we don't separate outbound from inbound. Like it's like if you're an SDR, you're doing it all, right? The how I, that's how I started my career. And I think it teaches you a lot about both. And so basically I tell reps the number one priority, the red, the red con alert, like what you stop doing and like and focus on inbound. When someone does a demo, second one is high intent leads. We, we're an intent tool, right? We de-anonymize web traffic. So when we see those intent leads, that's, that's priority number two. Then priority number three will be the high engagement from your outbound, right? And then that's mixed in with your MQLs from your webinars and white papers, right? But I, every day I do a little pop quiz every Monday when on our stand up for the week. I ask the SDR, especially new ones, hey, what is the number one priority today that you're going to look for? And they say, if I see in my task inbound request or inbound sequence is queued up, they're like, I'm going to stop what I'm doing and I'm going to go pay attention because everything else doesn't have as you know, such a high pressure tied to it. And they know that, right? And so it's important to establish that mindset. The next part that we have for process, right, is if you're coming actually inbound and you submit a, a, a demo request, we have that kick to an automated uh, first touch, a sequence that has five touch, touch points, right? Mm -hmm. And that first touch point is actually automated and it's tied to a separate rule set. I actually have it running 24 seven. If you submit it on a Sunday, you're gonna get an email from my team that two minutes later, I've gotten the SLA down to two minutes, two minutes later saying, hey, we saw you booked on a Sunday. Here's a calendar link to book during the work week, right? We're covering that. But it's not over there where I tell people is you always want to have it automated for speed to lead for the first touch point. But guess what all the other touch points are? Manual call, LinkedIn, manual email with a video. Like I am having them personalize a lot more beyond that. I just wanted to make sure I was the first one in their inbox. It's so interesting. I, I love this balance, Keegan. And it, it's so interesting. So you get speed to lead as low as possible by automating that first touch. That first touch, does it have calendar links for the rep in it, I presume, so they can book a meeting? Yeah, I have it round, round, round robin to the AEs and we break it actually down by a uh, segment. So if you're like yep. SMB pushes a different sequence, that's more for SMB inbound. If you're mid-market, up-market, you know, we have a specific trigger that sends that specific sequence. Perfect. Okay. That is a as a buyer of software, that's an appreciated experience from me. Like I want to be able to just choose a time when I'm inbound, when I'm coming to a company, it's okay to send scheduling links. I know it's a bit of a faux pas if you're outbound and you're sending scheduling links, mm -hmm. but somebody who's raising their hand coming to you, that first automated touch should be as fast as possible and it should come with a scheduling link. So I love that. Now, you're, you're really interested, right? You're like, hey, right. I'm spending the time. Like, 
I, you're kind of already looking for a link. We just didn't have it on the website potentially. Right. And that's right. like, that's okay to put in that. I call it, make it convenient for the buyer. Think of like, if you're working in hospitality and they're staying at your hotel, right. They don't want to have to go down to the concierge all the time and confirm that the appointment's done when they check in and they say, Hey, can you get us dinner reservations? They want you to make it and then tell them, they just leave a message. Hey, your reservation was made at this restaurant at 5 PM. And that's kind of the experience they want when they get your email. Hey, I don't want to have to reply manually and then go back and forth with calendars. I'm already interested. You qualified me with a couple of questions. Here's the link I want to book. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And now the follow on points though, you said are all manual touches and you started to say, not only are they manual, they're omni channel. This is such an interesting disconnect that I feel like a lot of people have. A lot of people say, oh, that person came inbound. They're just going to automatically book a meeting. No, they are not. No, yeah. they are not. I have chased demo request leads for, I think my record is like 17 months or something like that before they, before they finally took the meeting. Like, yes, they had initially expressed some intent, but that doesn't mean it's going to be a low effort exercise for you to get them over the line and get that meeting booked. And so treat them, if they don't respond immediately to that first automated email, you know you're going to have some work to do. And so executing basically like it's an outbound lead and showing up with personality, with video, showing up uh, omni-channel, on the phone, on LinkedIn, video messaging, text message, whatever, like yeah. you have to put in the, the sweat equity to earn that meeting more often than not. I, in my experience, something like 20 or 30% of people will respond to that automated email and, and book a time, but the other 70 to 80% won't. And it takes you chasing them to a certain extent omni-channel to get that confirmed. Is that, does that track with your experience? hundred percent. Like I have my inbound demo request, um, for the business here, like the most common one we have. And after a couple hundred people have been through this business, like specific segment of an inbound, uh, sequence, only 48% have converted. So what does that mean for the other, you know, 120 that are still outstanding, right? I'm having my reps chase that. And then we put them actually, we have another process that triggers that if they don't book when that sequence is over from inbound, where do they go? Outbound. Yep. Love that. Okay. So contextualizing that outreach, just again, just like outbound requires data inputs. And this is something that I know y'all at warmly have a pretty strong POV on. And I would love to understand, like, how do you think about signals? How do you think about data? How do you think about making it easy for a rep? So they don't get just like inundated with data and worried uh, like Woody here in this GIF about how, like, what should I actually pay attention to? What should I construct my outbound me or my, my messaging around? Like, what should I do? So, so talk to us a little bit about how you think about signals, how you think about data and how you can leverage that to convert as many leads as possible. Yeah. I actually think of like being a leader is like the mindset of like, when you're, I, I look at being a leader, like a coach, like I'm here leading, a, I always say like a football team. I'm Nick Saban. He's one of my favorites, but he retired, but I'm like, Nick Saban is what I joke with the team. And I always kind of think of like, Less is more for the reps. The reps have so much that they're already dealing with. Let me get the signals. Let me pump them into their place, into the, their systems, input that signal data, input that personalization or that copy yep. into their app on messaging port, whether it be LinkedIn, email for a call uh, script where it's like personalized to that sequence. Let me build that all out as the leader. So it's plug and play. So when I'm like, hey, here's the play. We've practiced it. We know, we know that we're going down midfield. Like they know exactly the route. They don't have to overthink it and they can just do it. So that's yeah. where I tell leaders, your job is to really build this out. So it's already on a platter for them. Don't give them the menu of options of here's this data point you can reference, this data point you can reference, because the reps going to be like, you know, I have like 20 of these after this one. So I'm already inundated with too much. So I actually build it out where it's seamlessly in the process, right? And some of the signals you, you, you talked about that we really focus on are, you know, we can see who's on the website and what their contextual engagement is. And so I actually have that feeding from the CRM to our sequencing tool, which is outreach. And I actually have that feeding to our LinkedIn automation as well within the platform. And mm -hmm. so I actually have them firing off simultaneously, right? So I have the data of like, Hey, this person was on the pricing page for 20 seconds and they started to fill out a form, but they abandoned it. So there's, there's a lot of data points there. Okay. They're on pricing. They're on the page for a while. And then they started to fill out a form and they abandoned it. Now that can confuse a rep of what the best playbook is. So given those data points, I have it queuing up the best sequence that I would put them in if I was in their shoes. So I actually have it where it triggers that sequence on behalf of the rep. And it's just a task. It's either an automated task or a manual task just to tell the rep this is the best sequence to choose. Unless you think otherwise, follow these steps. And so I basically put it almost like an assembly line. 
right? Nice. I put that data in there and I'm going after like, if they abandon a form, guess what? That's something that Warmly picks up. We have a sequence that's all about, hey, we saw you started to fill this out, but you stopped. Pretty cool that we could see that. Maybe the dogs were barking. We put a joke in there and then we continue. So a little bit of lighthearted humor. With yours, with copy.ai, we have it where if they uh, if it triggers and finds personalized information, we have that go to a what I call a high touch. Yep. And that queue up that sequence where the rep could see the messaging that's present from copy and see what else they want to add, or they could copy that and then put it in their LinkedIn approach. Because again, I have two engines firing where we're sending the email and the call task, and then we have the automation of LinkedIn firing off and warmly. Love that. Can can you show us some of this, Keegan? I know you you had some data to show and some processes to show. I don't know what is proprietary and what you're able to, to share with us, but it, it would be awesome to see the way that you've structured these things. Yeah, so I have it right here. So the sequence, so I have it basically with warm, I'm gonna share my screen. We did this earlier, we had a practice run, so we're good. <laughs> it all worked in the practice run. We it shall did. see if it works right. in real time. So we can see this, right? I don't see the screen yet. Oh, there it is. All right. So this is AI prospector within Warmly, right? We're seeing who we de-anonymize and we could see by the new contacts or sorry, known company, but unknown contacts. So like that's using six cents in Bora, which we resell or it's our own proprietary sources of data where we're actually identifying the individual coming to your site, whether they came from an email or maybe they just came to your site and we de-anonymize them, mm. right? We tracking, right? So that's one way. And then we have these filters saying, as long as they're not a customer, Right. And as long as they're not an active deal and they're the industry we want to go after, look up these personas and fire it off to the sequence. Right. So AI prospectors, what we label them. And then we have like the known company, unknown visitor. So you can see 37 people fired off to that. And that's where I'm saying, like, I'm speed to lead of everything. Like they come through those signals, go through, a, you know, yes, no boxes of the filters I build, fire it off to outreach is what, what we use and have that queue up the best sequence for the rep. Right. So it goes to the Sanka. Then she can actually open up, and then there's another one. There's like a bunch, but I wanted to show one right here. That if they are, here we go. It's this one. If they're uh, like a known visitor, like checking out our freemium, that's another signal, right? They're checking out our free page, like freemium page. They're not a customer. They have definitely hit the the web page, but maybe they didn't fill out the form. Well, then I have that queuing up the best sequence of like, hey, saw you checking out freemium. Maybe you're not ready to buy. Here's the link because we saw you didn't finish signing up for freemium because we're cross-referencing again the CRM, right? So I'm automating that. A lot of people be like, hey, queue this up because they hit the page. But then the rep's like, the rep might email them not knowing that they filled out the form and they are a freemium user, right? So I always say automate as much as you can with that speed elite. So I have it cross-referenced in the CRM. Once it's cross-referenced, then it fires off that. Yeah, sequence and outreach for the rep. So again, it's on a platter for the rep. And then the last part is I give the power of choice to the reps, right? So this is an actual prospect that we're using copy.ai in our custom fields. And you can see that they get to, it's again, we're on the AI prospector, right? And the copy AI messaging sequence that we're queuing up, they can see the messaging first and see if they need to tailor anything to tailor. I <laughs> get it. <laughs> but like, that's, that's exactly like what we do is we basically have everything queued up for the best speed to lead to optimize on that, right? And give them the best playbook. I call like stuff like this when you're connecting intent and sequences like a playbook. Yeah. And then we let them, we train them on being able to audit the messaging and choose from there. And that's why if you actually look at our whole sequences, um, you know, we, we're, we're still newer to copy.ai, but we love what we're seeing. But if we go to AI Prospector, which again, takes those signals, cross-references it with your CM, then auto prospects it to your sequencing tool of choice, whether it's Apollo, Sales Loft, um, Outreach, and through Salesforce, Groove, and, and uh, Gong, right? This is why we're seeing such great results because the speed of lead. These are automated touch points for the first one for the email. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing 10% reply rates, 3%, 4% with these high open rates from purely outbound emails that are triggered by warmly.ai. I always show these to people on demos. And I asked their feedback of like, are you seeing responses like this from your pure cold outbound? And they're like, no. God, no. <laughs> <laughs> but again, and I tell people, here's why. Messaging helps a lot. And this is where I was excited to talk to you about this, Kyle, is you and I are big believers in personalization. But I actually do tell people the one thing that could go head to head and sometimes be personalization is timing and relevance. Yeah. So if the messaging is on cue with the, like the audience that I'm trying to reach out to based on how they engaged, 
with us and showed intent signals. And I email them within 30 seconds of them being on the site. And then, yeah, I would say 70% of it's relevant to them. That is the beauty of speed to lead with relevance. That's the, the And that's a key point, Keegan. And that's what buyers expect now. And so trying to summarize everything you just showed, which is really amazing, by the way, is in the old world, the rep would have to be the one that's kind of stitching together all these different data points and putting together some sort of strategy based on the data that they're receiving. But in the new world, what it takes is it takes somebody like yourself, Keegan, or I'm sure somebody on your team to create these processes that's taking the right data points and saying like, if then, if we get this signal, then execute this step. And like you've said a couple of times, put it on a silver platter for the rep. Don't require the rep to be the one who's swimming through the data. That's what machines are for. Let the machines do that work so that the rep can go in and put that, get the messaging really, you know, last mile type messaging work or doing the manual steps that are required to convert these leads or whatever it may be. So you can up, get, maximize or minimize speed to lead. You can make sure that your reps are as equipped as possible and you can contextualize that outreach by leveraging all of these signals and all of this data and putting AI to work. 100%. And what I, I tell people is like, I did build this out, by the way. I built this Absolutely. out. One person can build this out because I, I joined it warmly very early and we're now, you know, a bigger uh, team working, growing towards our Series B, which is exciting. But again, when we came in, like, this is where I tell people, if you're going to join startups, this is a, usually one person can build this. I want to prove to everyone watching, like, one person can. And then what you do is you teach the people under you to start building it and making it better. And then you re-break it and you build it for scale, right? And I 100% go back to that because I've read a lot of leadership books and I actually used to be an athletic coach. And I tell people all the time, it's like Jocko Willick said it great. Make sure that the plan is so simple that your lowest level tier employee or a cognitive person of cognitive ability would understand it and be able to write the playbook themselves. And the best way that we can do that, because a lot of these SDRs are relatively new, right? Um, and AEs are, their minds already like racing with negotiations, falling up on contracts. Yeah. The best thing I can do as a leader to get to those results that I want is build out the playbook that honestly puts it on a platter for them and covers what I think is important to the business. Because again, if you're a leader, you know a lot more about the business initiatives and goals and the acumen. Your reps are going to get there one day, right? Maybe they are, but they've already, been, they have, already have so many other things they're handling. Yep. You as a leader can empower this for them. So they have limited options that are the best choice for them. It's really well said. And so a lot of the, the workflow that you just showed, Keegan, is taking behavior, actual user behavior, and then creating the right sorts of outreach programs to capitalize on whatever level of intent somebody is showing through their behavior. And that is wonderful. Let's talk a little bit now about context. And I want to share some things from mm -hmm. Copy AI. So what you're looking at here in Copy AI is these are all pre-built workflows that you can go and run right now. And I'm just going to show some of the enrichment ones that we have. So we have all these different workflows that trigger enrichment for people or for accounts based on some sort of uh, input that you give them. So given an email address or given a LinkedIn URL or whatever it is, go and enrich that person. And let me show you how that actually looks in Salesforce. So this is my buddy, Josh. I changed his email address so that you can't uh, contact Scrub. him, scrubbedemail.com, not a real thing. And so what the enrichment is doing is not only is it classifying uh, Josh and saying he is a tier one, two or three lead for X, Y, Z reason and giving the actual rationale for why the lead score is what it is, but it's also scraping his LinkedIn profile and then doing a little bit of inference on what it learns from his LinkedIn profile. So now without having to jump out of my CRM, and this could all be delivered to you in Slack or Teams or whatever as well, but I get to see where Josh has been. I get to see where he's working right now, a small company called Google. I get to see what's going on at Google, good and bad. And then from a contextual standpoint, I get, um, actually, let me talk about this. I get industry terms that Josh is likely to care about, which is really useful, especially uh, to inform my talk tracks or my video messaging. And then here is what the AI is also doing. It's saying inferred from Josh's profile based on his work experience and his title. These are not responsibilities that he has written on his LinkedIn profile. This is the AI inferring what his job responsibilities are likely to be. So now I have a bullet point list of his jobs to be done, the things that are likely on his mind. And then the AI goes and says, based on what we learned about Josh, here are the use cases he's likely to care about for copy AI. 
onboarding, success playbooks, training, expansion opportunities, lead engagement. Okay, cool. Then it takes these workflows and writes them into emails that are automatically delivered. We use outreach as well, automatically delivered via outreach. So it's that kind of context, which is the like the exact right thing that people expect that, you know, they may come to your website and if your website isn't personalized to them, then they may be interested, but not totally clear on what they're going to be able to use your product for. So being able to follow up in a contextual way to say, thanks for visiting. And by the way, here are some use cases that you're likely to enjoy. Like that's what people expect, especially inbound leads expect. So I'll, I'll stop blabbering, but I just think it's such a cool workflow. I love it too. I wanted to show like, you can have that same dream that he's showing you, by the way, for all you HubSpot users. I know it's becoming more common. We have that right. Oh, that's the wrong thing. <laughs> we have that in, in our own uh, CRM. We use HubSpot and we have it exactly doing what you just said. I have the copy AI email one, two, and three pushing over to my outreach. And that's why you're seeing it right here that it's already pre-written, which is exciting, right? This is just one example of many that I'm building out. But again, I'm helping my, my reps maybe on a cloudy day already having the most optimal messaging presented to them that they can either send, we can automate, or if they wanted to tweak a little bit and add their own flavor, they could, right? And 100%, exactly. that's actually one of my favorite flows. After seeing how many flows you have, I definitely have to get back on with your team because um, we could use more. But that's where it leads to something I talk about speed to lead, Kyle, is um, I also tell people AI and sales is here to help you. One thing I'm very known and outspoken about is AI is not going to replace sales. And I know you've said that the same thing too, right? You do need a, a person there, but man, you know what it can replace? This unnecessarily high headcount now, right? Because it's helping optimize what your reps are doing. You just said the context. And I said, we're optimizing the speed, right? Yes. What if you put those two together and you actually can, the way that we're using copy.ai, and this is not an integration. I'm just saying like the way we use it is we have the sequence queued up and then we have that, first step being manual, which gives it enough time for copy.ai to push over to outreach. Right. And the rep can act by the time the rep gets there within two minutes, five minutes, maybe 20 minutes to that step, they, uh, they actually see the messaging. Now, if I wanted to automate that, I just delay the email by 10 minutes. Right. hundred percent. That, that's really well said. Um, some, some people are asking in the chat, like, well, how, how, how exactly does this work? Um, sorry, my dog is getting in Lost. on the action here. Um, and what we find is just like the way you have it set up, Keegan, that's what reps want. They, they don't want to be bouncing around to, they already are using like 10 or 15 or 20 different apps and they don't want to be bouncing around into yet another platform. So delivering them the contextualized messaging where they work, outreach for you, sales loft, groove, CRM, Slack teams, whatever, like that's what our platform allows for that, you know, true integration so that you as the admin or as the operations person, as the SDR manager, whatever, you can choose where that uh, info that the generative AI stuff gets piped into. And that just creates a much better user experience and really reduces the amount of change management. Now, to the point you just made, a lot of people are worried like, oh, AI is going to replace us. Right now, it's really bleak for AEs and SDRs. Like 30% of people are hitting quota, 30%. And so what I believe AI is going to do is it's going to make everybody, every individual and every team just a lot more performant. So you won't need, there won't necessarily be 50 SDR roles at a company. Maybe there'll be 30, but those 30 people are actually going to be hitting quota. And that is then going to create more opportunity for other companies to exist and other people to be uh, on performant teams. So that's kind of the way that I see it. We just have a lot of bloat right now with a lot of yeah. people that are doing manual tasks and are missing quota because their time is just not well spent. So that that's the future that I envision. Maybe that's a little too rosy. No, I, I agree though. I tell people like, again, AI is there to enhance and optimize. The only thing it's replacing is what you just said, the bloated headcount. Like when I used to build out SDR orgs, we'd build out 50 SDRs for, you know, a 250 to 300 person company. That's a lot of SDRs. Yeah. You can now probably do that same outcome and, and reach those goals with about 25 to 30 because of AI helping optimize, right? That's why it's like when you use these sequencing tools, they're like 3X your output. Well, you know, now we know everyone's doing that. So it's a little numbing to the fact. But what we can do is optimize the context, right? The speed to lead and the relevance. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And what what's really cool, um, kind of getting back to this point around, there's so much data to wrangle. There are so many processes to try and run. There are so many use cases. What we've tried to do is we've tried to put it all together into what we call 
the AI sales OS. So the OS is a collection of workflows that are designed to accomplish some sort of purpose-built use case or task or process or to-do to automate the repetitive, automate the mundane so that the humans can focus on thinking, being creative, being strategic, making sure that you are spending the right amount of time doing the manual things that robots can't do. And that's what we're trying to do with this AI sales OS. So Jax, um, I think it has a poll ready. If you want to see a full demo of everything that we have in AI sales OS and understand more about the integrations and all the rest, we are doing a, a deeper dive on that, not just tomorrow, but every Thursday for the rest of our lives at 9 a.m. Pacific. So if you're interested in seeing that, please um, just say yes in the chat. We'll hook you up. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice. So um, any closing thoughts here, Keegan? We're, we're coming up on time, but any any parting words or words of wisdom? I Again, I'm just going to always tell people it's it the age that we the digital age that we live in right is always changing ever so fast compared to when it was the early 2000s and the late 90s right and so you can either be part of the change and jump on the trend and be the early adopter and benefit or you can be the laggard and not reap the benefits but maybe be part of the changes in a negative way and so i always tell people don't be afraid of change especially in this digital digital age embrace, adapt, A-B test, and ride the wave. Ride the wave and don't get crushed by it. I totally agree. I, I find, I was thinking about this over the weekend because I'm always on and I'm a nerd like that. Sounds like you are too. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I was thinking like if I were an individual rep right now, or if I were getting started as an SDR or an AE right now, what would I do? How would I think about future-proofing myself? And the main things that the main advice that I would give everybody, and I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, this doesn't have anything really to do with speed to lead. So bear with me. I would think about developing a handful of skills. Number one is a business acumen. You really need to know not just the product that you're selling, not just the personas that you're selling to, but the companies that you're selling to and the financial metrics that people care about. What is customer acquisition cost? What is lifetime value? What are payback periods? What is ARR and NDR and MRR and active users and MAUs, DA? Like you need to know all of the metrics, all of the acronyms that matter. It's that kind of business acumen that makes you more of a strategic advisor and not just a seller. So if you um, if you can educate yourself on those business metrics, that leads into point number two, which is executive presence. You've got to be able to command a room. You've got to be able to present with confidence. You have to be able to quarterback a deal and pull the right people in internally from your company and say, hey, CEO, I need you on this call. Come with me. And you have to have that gravitas. So executive presence is, is number two. The third thing is sales acumen. You've re like you were just saying, you've been a student of management books. You're reading, you mentioned Jocko. That's awesome. Like I do the same exact thing. You have to commit to learning. You have to commit to improving and developing real sales acumen is extremely important. The things that AI can't do, negotiation, effective demos, discovery, like these things don't go out of style. So learn EQ. about those things. Yeah, EQ, exactly. And then the last thing, as you just said, don't get crushed by the wave. Learn about AI. Invest in learning about how AI can go to work for you. If you don't do that yourself, don't expect your company to do it. Don't be the Spider-Man meme where everybody's pointing at each other. Like go and invest in learning yourself and put this to work yourself. If you wait for somebody else to do it for you, it's probably, you're probably going to be too late. So those would be my four tips and that just popped into my mind. So any response? what you said though, on that last part though, Kyle, is like the biggest thing someone could take out of your great four tips is the first step is finding a mentor to help guide you in that acumen understanding. And so, you know, I, I was lucky enough to have four VPs uh, growing up in my life of billion dollar companies built, not million billion. Like they've been around for 80 plus years, the company, right. And they finally got to that VP level. And that's what made my acumen just so much further by finding those mentors. So Kyle is right. You need to go after all those four tips. The best way to get started. If you're a little lost from that, go find someone, you know, and trust that has that business acumen and pick the brain. 100%. We want we want to give advice to people. I I have new reps hit me up all the time. I'm a small fish. I'm like an early stage executive, right? I always say, hey, if you want to talk to me about early stage, I can. If you're more at the conglomerate businesses, you might want to find a mentor in that. But I want to share my knowledge of wealth because that's how we build the next generation. It's really well said, Keegan. You're doing a service to everybody, so thank you. That is a wrap. We're we're at our 45 minute mark. So thank you, Keegan. This has been awesome. Where can people go? 
to learn more about you? Where can people go to learn more about Warmly? Yeah. So you can just type in warmly.ai to check out Warmly. Um, and you can look up Keegan Otter, the software cowboy, or if you just type in the software cowboy and LinkedIn, I'm the first one that pops up with this nice hat right here. <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And if you're interested in learning more about us, we're just copy.ai. I'll drop the link in the chat. And as Jax has said, if you want to see the a fuller demo of AI Sales OS, you can join us every Thursday. So Keegan, thank you for the time. This has been awesome. Really appreciate it. Kyle, thanks, man. See you. Cheers. Bye.